Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we kicking off our uh, series this fall in building a biblical church from Paul's first letter to Timothy. I'm going to begin with uh, pictures, show that uh, set of pictures. Anybody recognize that? Some of you, anybody been to Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris? Yes, lucky you. I hope one day to get to go there and see that. Um, let's go to the next picture. Some of y'all may have seen this in the news back in 2019. The, the uh, cathedral was actually under renovation because of weathering and other uh, sort of age-related decay. Um, when a fire broke out, nearly nearly burned the whole thing down. And, uh, of course, they're undergoing renovations now. That's the last set of pictures. And, and uh, I thought this would be an appropriate way to introduce the, the season and to give context for what we're doing as a church in terms of teaching through uh, biblical guidance for what the church is in, in this season of our church's life. See, you all know that's a church building. It's not a church, right? A church is people. Church isn't the building. But the analogy is still appropriate. It still holds. Sometimes a church needs renovation. And actually, Notre Dame Cathedral is almost a thousand years old, it, especially if you count from when they started building it. it took a long time to, to, to build it. Um, and it's been through numerous renovations over its history. There's this old joke in, in uh, Baptist life that you, you can't change a light bulb when it burns out in a Baptist church. You know why? Because my grandmother donated that light bulb, right? And you, you, we laugh at that because there's a measure of truth to that, but, but, what, but what's, happening in, what's happening in that sentiment, there's actually something good to it because what it is, it's a value for where we've been. It's a value for, for the history and the contributions that people have made to the church. And so when you talk about renovations, there is this fear, you know, hey, are we leaving behind an important part of our past? And no, we're not doing that. Renovation of a church is about repairing what's broken, repairing what is, has degraded over time, and also promoting and protecting and preserving what is good and true and beautiful so the church can go into the future and continue to have a ministry. That's, that's what Reset is about. And um, the pastors of our church believe we're following the Spirit's leadership to, to do this series at this season where we're focusing on a unique letter in the Bible that, that is explicitly about God's instructions for the nature and function of the church. I know that uh, you share this fundamental commitment that I have to the Bible first and foremost, not my preferences or, or any other such thing, but to the Bible first and foremost about who we are and how we function as a church. And so we just believe that this season of immersing ourselves in God's instruction related to the church is important for where we are. Now, um, we're calling this building a biblical church because as you will see in this letter over this uh, fall season, um, and it's closely paralleled in Titus, you're going to see that, that, that Paul, the Apostle Paul, gives important instructions uh, regarding the nature, God's plan for what the church is, and what's happening in this letter is Paul is addressing a church that's gotten off track, addressing Timothy about a church that's gotten off track, and, and how to come back to God's plan for his church. Now, I'm characterizing the first few weeks of, of what we're doing in 1 Timothy as building materials, building materials. What do we build the church with? And the first building material that we encounter in 1 Timothy is sound teaching sound teaching. There's probably no element that's more important to what's happening in this letter than the idea of sound teaching. And so the big, the, the, the essence of what's happening in this passage of Scripture is a call for us. We must ensure that our church is built with sound biblical teaching. Let's pray, and then we'll, uh, we'll approach this text. Father, thank you for this opportunity to open your word with my brothers and sisters. Please help us to receive your word for what it is and, and, and to respond to it with reverence and humility. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, just to, uh, I don't normally skip around a whole lot. I'm going to let you know that th that's happening in this message a little bit. Because of the way that chapter 1 is structured, I'll be focusing primarily on verses 1 to 7, and then we'll jump down to 18 to 20, because there's kind of one main idea going, and then there's some asides uh, 
Next week, we'll look at a part of what skipped, and today I'll, I'll briefly refer to verses 8 through 11, but they're, they're a little bit of an aside to the main point. So that's how we're going to approach this. Now, the first uh, idea here that we're going to consider is a church off track. What's going on in 1 Timothy? Uh, let's begin by reading verses 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy... My true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, as I mentioned, this is the first of two letters that Paul has written to Timothy. Timothy is not his literal child, but a a spiritual child, a a close partner in ministry for for, uh, many years by this point. By the time he's writing this letter, this is fairly late in in Paul's life. And uh, as he's writing this letter... To Timothy, he's writing to this partner who's been with him as they planted churches, churches in, in the regions of Asia Minor and around Europe and began uh, establishing those churches and, and helping them become self-sustaining. So, so understand that when Paul's writing this, this is not a church that Paul and Timothy are unfamiliar with. This is a church they've spent years with. Some people think Timothy may even have been one of their elders, but in whatever the case, there's, there are deep relationships with this church between both Paul and Timothy and leadership, uh, relationships with, with, with church leadership. Now, um, unfortunately, he's writing this letter because over time this church had begun to drift off track and, and Paul, as he's writing this letter, has been with Timothy working to resolve some of the issues that have led the church off track, but Paul has to go to Macedonia for reasons we don't know, but he has to go, and he, and he goes away, and he writes Timothy while he's away, this letter reminding Timothy of the most essential issues that he's to be working on, that this church needs to be considering. And so that's really important for us to consider, that we're getting like the main concerns that Paul has for how, as he's going to put it, to build the, the, the household of God, the church of the living God. So, what I'm saying is this letter functions to reinforce the essential concerns and instructions that Paul gave Timothy for the sake of the church. And I mentioned this last week, that if you go to chapter 3 and verse 14 and 15, you will find that Paul makes it explicit that these instructions are not just for that church. They're for how one ought to conduct himself, I'm quoting, in the household of God, the church of the living God. In other words, these are instructions for every church. They apply to our church. So let's look more closely at what was going on. Uh, Beginning in verse 3, Paul writes, As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus, so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, not to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Now, Paul does this sometimes where he will refer in his letters to certain persons, and that's not usually a good thing um, for the persons that are being referred to, and as is the case here. By the time we get to the end of this passage, he actually names some of these certain persons. Hymenaeus and Alexander, we'll see that in a little bit, are named And I think the reason that those two in particular are named is because they were influential leaders as sort of at the center of of, of what was going on to lead this church off track. In fact, there are a number of solid scholars who think that Hymenaeus and Alexander were actually elders, pastors. By the way, elder, pastor, overseer, it's all in the New Testament. Those are used interchangeably. But these, these guys are elders in the church. Maybe that's not the case. Not every scholar thinks that, but I'm going to give you three reasons why these folks probably were elders. One, because of their teaching platform within the, affecting the whole church. That's typically an elder kind of pastor role. Two, because they, what they're doing, and I'll explain this a little bit further later, what they're doing, Paul contrasts what they're doing in their teaching with the stewardship from God 
but it's by faith. So there's this idea of stewardship that they're not fulfilling. That also seems maybe that fits. And then thirdly, because in this letter, Paul gives a lot of instruction about qualifications for elders and even what to do when an elder needs correction. So those are three reasons why these guys probably were elders, but even if they're not, they're, they're clearly influential leaders in the congregation. Now, what are the issues with these? What's, what's going on with these certain persons? Um, I'm going to boil that down in two related phrases. One issue is unsound character, and the other issue is unsound teaching, and those are related. And just to be sure that we're on the same page, by sound, I mean reliable, true, nothing rotten in it, right? So, so, so unsound teaching is, is, has got something unreliable in it, something false or, or something like that, right? Same thing with character. So look, look at verses 5 and 6. There's a relationship between those two things that Paul draws out. It's a little bit subtle, but it's definitely here. So take a look. Verse 5, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Pure heart, good conscience, sincere faith sounds like character, heart, you know, kind of heart issues, right? Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion. Desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding what they're saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. So you see what happened? Certain persons, because of the unsound character, because of what was going on in their heart, have swerved away into unsound teaching. There's a relationship. And that's actually not unusual. Jesus, of course, taught us that out of the uh, mouth, the overflow of the heart comes, right? Whatever's in here eventually comes out in our communication and so here you've got an issue with Christian preaching or teaching that's gone wrong. And this, it, this is, if, if, if you haven't considered this before, maybe if you, if you haven't been in a teaching role before, Christian teaching, whether you're doing what I'm doing or you're in a Sunday school, it's fundamentally, it's heart work. Heart work. Right? There's a, you can just say stuff, but you, 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 you can't, preach or teach like a Christian unless what's inside matches, right? Unless there's some kind of correspondence between what's in here and what you're, what you're saying. And so it's fundamentally, it's a, it's a heart work. When the heart isn't right, the teaching will be affected. Sometimes this, is, this, is, this goes unrecognized because it's, it's subtle. It's hard to pick it up. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you by what's, what, what he's going to say next about what went wrong here, why that happens. But generally speaking, People that have prominent teaching ministries within a church are decent communicators. And the better communicator you are, the easier it is to, to, to conceal, maybe to hide what's really is not right. Do you follow that? That's going on here. Okay. So what's exactly, what exactly was the problem? What's going wrong with the teaching? Well, Paul says a few different things that give us the picture. First, he says to instruct them to teach, not to teach different, different doctrine, different teaching. Heterodidaskalia is the Greek. This other and teaching is the idea. Different from what? Other from what? Other from what the apostles were teaching. Other from the authoritative word of God that came through Jesus and his apostles. The way that we would say that is they were teaching different from the Bible. So at the time this is written, the New Testament hasn't been codified and collected and bound into a nice leather thing that I can hold, right? A book. But the apostles are teaching the New Testament, what we would call the New Testament. They're teaching that, and these folks are teaching other than that. So for our purposes, we're talking about folks that by their teaching are teaching different from what the Bible teaches. Now, someone will say, that doesn't happen in my church or in my group or whatever. It doesn't happen. And what they mean by that is, is my pastor or my teacher or whoever, it, it, he, he's reading the Bible. He's commenting from the Bible, right? Justin gets up there and he reads the Bible and he says some stuff. And so it's, he's teaching the Bible. Well, if you pay attention to what Paul's saying, you'll realize the folks that Timothy has to address are doing that. That's in verse 7. Desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding what they're saying. And, and, but let's focus on desiring to be teachers from the law. And as you read the rest of this, this letter, you see very clearly it's definitely what they're doing. When he refers to genealogies here, when he refers to the law, we would call the way we would refer to the law, we would say the Old Testament. 
He's talking about the Hebrew Scriptures. At the time this is written, the church had, uh, they did have a Bible, a, a, what we would say a paper Bible. It was the old, what we call the Old Testament. And they had the apostles teaching, interpreting that in light of Jesus. And so these guys are teaching the Bible, sort of, right? They're reading the Bible and they're commenting from the Bible, but what's, go, what's gone wrong with it? What's the problem if that's what they're doing? The problem is that they're misusing, misapplying the Bible. Look at verse 8. Now, we know that the law is good, the Bible, the Old Testament, he's referring to. We know that the Old Testament is good. We know the law is good if one uses it lawfully. That's obviously a play on words that Paul's doing there. But what's the idea? Yeah, it would be good if they were teaching the Hebrew Scriptures, but they're teaching them in such a way that they're invalidating or nullifying the actual message of the Bible. They're misusing, misapplying. Their interpretation, in other words, their applications are unsound. Now, scholars do a lot of, they kind of wonder about the myths and the endless genealogies. and it's, They're not certain about exactly what that is, but what seems to be what, what many people think is the case is that effectively what they're doing is taking parts of Scripture and sort of like re, where there's not much information and reading in stuff that really is in the Bible and then teaching people to live a certain way on the basis of that. We'll see some of that in chapter Four, and then I think there's some more in uh, Second Timothy if we ever if we ever do that one. But it was I'm sure it was interesting to listen to their unsupported speculations into the meaning of Scripture. The problem was not that the problem was that it just wasn't sound. It was not the diligent work of a pastor or teacher who ears up a want of folks who need not be ashamed because he accurately handles the word of truth. Right. They were able to take the very words of Scripture and turn them into something that was different than the teaching of Jesus and his apostles. But they sounded so sure. They sounded so right. They sounded so compelling. They sounded confident. Paul says they make confident assertions about things they don't understand. The confidence, the presentation wasn't the issue. Brothers and sisters, interesting oratory, compelling rhetoric, confident proclamation is not the same thing as truth. Right? That's what Paul's saying here. Now, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, a, a preacher of some repute, uh, wrote about this over 100 years ago. Uh, as he, he's, What I'm going to read to you is, is directed toward preachers, uh, but it's applicable to You'll see the significance. He says, Nowadays, we hear men tear a single sentence from its connection and cry, uh, a sentence of Scripture, and cry, Eureka, Eureka, as if they had found a new truth. And yet they have not discovered a diamond, but only a piece of broken glass. Had they been able to compare spiritual things with spiritual? Had they understood the analogy of faith? Had they been acquainted with the holy learning of great Bible students of past ages? They would not have been quite so fast in vaunting their marvelous knowledge. Let us be thoroughly well acquainted with the great doctrines of the word of God. And let us be mighty in expounding the scriptures. Catch this, church. I am sure, he's right, I am sure that no preaching will last so long or build up a church so well as the expository, meaning the preaching that exposes the actual text of Scripture. Right? No preaching will build up a church so well or last as long as the expository. He says, to renounce altogether the hortatory discourse for the expository would be running to a preposterous extreme. What he's saying there is, our goal in being faithful to, to, to sound teaching is not to be boring and dull. Rest assured, that's not my goal. I mean, it's in the Lord's hands to some respect and in my hands to, to try not to be boring. Okay? That's not the goal. And Spurgeon's saying it isn't the goal. Like, you're not more faithful just because you're boring. But we need to recognize, we need to recognize that just being interesting, just being compelling, just Having people like what we said is not the same thing as saying what is true of exposing the Scripture. That's what Spurgeon's rightfully saying. He's telling these preachers, master the Bible so that you can build people up, not with your precious insights, but with the Word of God. He goes on. It is painful to observe how many embrace anything if it be but earnestly brought before them. Brothers and sisters, we can apply that little gem of a sentence in church or anywhere you can apply it when you're looking on your phone at whatever. You can apply it when you listen to anybody. Earnestly bringing something before someone is not in itself a reason to believe what's being said is true. 
They swallow the medicine of every spiritual quack who has enough brazen assurance to appear to be sincere. I say to you, as Paul wrote to the Corinthians, Brethren, be not children in your understanding. Test everything that claims your faith. Now, brothers and sisters, churches like ours, churches we would go to, our church, this applies to us. Spurgeon is a Baptist, old Baptist, talking to Baptist preachers, and he's right. And I think we would benefit from reset in this regard in particular, not just in our church, but in American evangelicalism as a whole, because (laughs) we take this Bible and our commitment to it as the inerrant word of God. This is God's inerrant word, and we're going to build our lives around it. We're going to build our church around it. That's our heritage, isn't it? And it is. It is our heritage. Not only our heritage, but, but, but this, is we, this is who we are. And yet I'm concerned that, that even though we say we're committed to the inerrant authority of the Scriptures for our lives and our teaching, we're too concerned about what we like or what we think will work in our churches sometimes and not concerned enough about what is biblical in our churches. So what's the effect here? What's the effect of unsound teaching Unsound teaching hurts people. It hurts people. It harms people and leads them away from faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I spent some time, and I'm not going to be detailed about this at all, recently talking with a dear sister who called me in the wake of a tragedy in her family, a death and a near relative really struggling. and She's really struggling. And in the course of our conversation, she was asking me questions, biblical theological questions, and talking about what was going on. And and in the course of that conversation, I was exposed to some of the teaching, not from our church, but some of the teaching from a church that her relative goes to. And I was horrified by it. It was literally harming their faith, saying things like, if you just had enough faith, this death wouldn't have happened, that sort of thing. Causing people to think about, whether was it some sin I did? that is a result of this. Unsound teaching hurts people, and it leads them away from the faith. Unsound teaching damages the life and the witness of the church. Unsound teaching takes a church off track. What is a church off track? A church off track is a church that doesn't function the way that God intends it to function. A church off track is a church where the true faith is buried buried under layers of unsound teaching and unsound practice. Watch this. A church off track might be a struggling congregation. Or a church off track might be a booming congregation with lots of excited people, large budgets and influence in the community, for example. This week I read an article. I I can read an article like this about once every two weeks easily. This week I read an article about a church in Tennessee that was the fastest growing church in America in 2015 was featured in Lifeway magazine. You might recognize that, Southern Baptist. It was featured in Outreach magazine. Um, 2015, fastest growing church in America. They've imploded uh, because of a scandal. And that's, that's not the part that I'm... Po- what I want you to catch about this is that while everybody was looking at this booming church as a model for a church on track, in reality, what nobody could see or what most people couldn't see was what was underneath all that was completely unsound. And so a few years later, boom, it blows up. That's what I'm wanting you to catch in this. What that story, I can read that story or hear that story from people that I know and I have. um, Once every couple of weeks, I can hear a story. like This is happening all over the place. Why? I suggest at least one reason is because superficial and sub-biblical ideas about how to grow a church have pushed aside biblical guidance in churches just like ours. So the church, if you lived in Tennessee, you might have gone to it. And we're reaping the consequences everywhere. That's why we have to ensure that our church is built with sound teaching. Verse 5 and 11, the need for sound teaching. Verse 5, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Verse 11, when Paul's talking about sound doctrine or sound teaching, He says that it is in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God 
with which I've been entrusted. Talking about that sound doctrine. Gospel. What is sound teaching? How does it differ from unsound? What are its effects? How do they differ from unsound? Sound teaching never strays from the gospel. The gospel of salvation from the wrath of God do our sins. Because Jesus, who was born of the Virgin Mary, God, in, 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 in uh, John's way of putting it, God became flesh, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us and lived the life that we didn't live and should have and died in our place on a Roman cross according to the Scriptures and who was resurrected, as Paul puts it in Romans 4, resurrected for our justification. That gospel, sound teaching, keeps that central and it accords with that The gospel, the good news that Jesus will come again, he will return, he will judge the world, he will bring about a renewal of all things. Behold, I am making all things new, is his promise. Sound teaching exposes the meaning of the Bible. That's what Spurgeon was talking about. Sound teaching includes explaining the meaning of Scripture in such a way that others can see how the teacher came to the conclusion that he drew, right? It's not a trust me kind of, we're not doing that here. It's not a trust me, the Bible says that. I need to not only read the scripture, I need to somehow help you to see that what I'm saying came from this. That's sound teaching. Sound teaching includes applying the scriptures in ways that are consistent with the whole of scripture. Sound teaching includes not perfect, but sound character. Jesus with the Pharisees, right? Inside, it looks great on the outside, but inside it's, it's rotten. And what was the effect of their teaching? Jesus said, you, you, you load burdens up on people that they can't possibly carry. How? Not literally. You do it with your teaching. And then you don't lift a finger to help them. Sound teaching is spiritually powerful because sound teaching brings God's word to the hearts of those who hear it. Sound teaching is essential to God's plan for making disciples of all nations. Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Sound teaching strengthens the church and promotes spiritual growth, growth that lasts. Sound teaching teaches us to love what we ought to love rather than merely reinforcing our predispositions or preferences. Sound teaching protects the church from unsound teaching. Sound teaching leads to love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. This is why in God's instruction for the nature and function of his church, the first thing we encounter is build it with sound teaching. That leads us to the responsibility that we have as a church, and especially those of us who teach within the church, to ensure that the church is built with sound teaching. Verses 18 to 20, Paul says, This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, My child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, other scriptures involved here, we're we're probably talking about Timothy's ordination. In accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. I like the other translation, fight the good fight. That you may fight the good fight. Holding faith and a good conscience by rejecting this, some have made a shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Many of the things that Paul says to Timothy here mirror the critiques of unsound teachers he made earlier. For example, he's telling Timothy, you have a responsibility, you have a stewardship from God, a trust that you have to fulfill. Timothy, you got to go teach what's true and what's right, and you got to do so, Timothy, keeping the faith in a good conscience. Sound familiar? Timothy, you must be willing to fight the good fight for what is true, for what is right, for what is good, for the sake of the church. Timothy, you must be willing to deal with hard choices, uncomfortable circumstances, even in some cases putting people out of the church, leaders whose unsound teaching is harming the church. That, by the way, is if some of you are like, what just happened? We were here talking about sound teaching, and then people are getting handed over to Satan. What happened? When Paul, that's Paul, Pauline language for excommunication. 
If you read 1 Corinthians 5, you, some of you may be already familiar with that passage. You know there's a, there's a, a man in a church whose unrepentant uh, sin is, is having a gangrenous effect in the church, and the church has to deal with it. And Paul says he's already made this judgment, and he needs to be removed from the church. But he uses this language of handing him over to Satan. What is that? What does that mean? It, what, it, what most people think it means, and I agree, uh, most scholars think, is, is that what Paul is saying is that the church, within the church, within good fellowship within the church, you're under the sphere of God's influence. You're, you're under this, this sphere where God's will is prized and, 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 and reigns. Outside the church, you're in that place where Satan's will dominates and reigns. And putting a person out in unrepentance and saying, this is the consequence, this is, this is where you're going, this is what you're doing. This is the world that you're choosing to live in can actually bring a person to their, to their senses to realize, I need to repent. I want to go back in, into the church. That sort of thing is what's happening. So, so in short, Paul calls upon Timothy to help this church get back on track, first and foremost, with a return to sound teaching. And in the rest of this letter, Paul will encourage Timothy with four emphases. Four emphases. Each of these emphases Brothers and sisters, for us, is important to consider as we are seeking a fruitful future that God has called us to pursue. First, obviously, teaching. Ensure that your teaching is biblically sound. Not just in the pulpit, not just in the classroom. Yes, there. Yes, there. But also in our governing documents, in our statements of faith, in our, our statements of value and identity, and in our hearts. I was talking with a, with a uh, brother, Brandon, the other day about this. He put it really well. Our, our, our teaching isn't just in what you say. He's right. It's also in what we write, whether that's what some of us put on Facebook or what we have on our website under the heading of bylaws, right? All that teaches about the nature of the church and what we believe about it. Second emphasis, worship gatherings. There's instruction in this letter, a focus on how we worship God together and organize ourselves. Is that biblically sound? Three, leadership. Ensuring the church is led by qualified elders and served by qualified deacons is a focus in this letter. Fourth, relationships. Ensuring the way that we relate to one another is biblically sound. Now, offer just a couple of points of application before we conclude. First, we will build our church with sound teaching. We will do that. That's what we're going to do. We will not attempt to build a biblical church with unbiblical teaching or unbiblical practices. We cannot. We know better. We know that we cannot achieve godly ends with ungodly means. We can't achieve a biblical paradigm for our church with unbiblical teaching or practices. You can't do it. And I emphasize this because there's a blind spot. I think there's a, a, a major blind spot um, in, in, in my own personal life. You know, it's, it's, we all know this, a blind spot's a blind spot. You don't see what you don't see, right? Some of my own personal experiences, both educational and ministry experiences, have opened my eyes to some things that I'm telling you when I first came into ministry, I didn't see that. I see it differently now, okay? A lot. I'm saying there is a large blind spot in American evangelical Christianity right now. I think it's an important contributing factor, a reason that we're seeing one church scandal after another like the one I shared earlier. What is it? Here it is. American evangelicals are way too worried about building mega churches. We let shallow, unbiblical, worldly guidance push aside and shape how our churches function from how we worship to how we govern ourselves, to who leads, to all of it. it. It affects everything for one primary end, okay? We let shallow, unbiblical, worldly guidance shape us because it makes the numbers go up. That's it. Is it. Now, if you don't think gifted communicators and preachers can spin that and pretty that up... <laughs> You, you just can't be in my shoes. <laughs> and the things that go on to keep the numbers up in some too many churches would heart break your heart. It would break your heart. We're not doing that. <laughs> We're not doing that. None of us wants to do that. We're going to stay alert to that. 
And we're not going to tolerate that. Two, we will distinguish between attracting crowds and making disciples as our mission. Why? Because we want to realize the goal, the goal that Jesus gave us of sound teaching, of disciples who think and act like Jesus, loving people with pure hearts, sincere faith, and clean consciences. There are a lot of ways to make the numbers go up, but only sound teaching makes disciples. Now, well, I'm going to skip my last application. I'm running out of time, and I want to get to this that I think is even more important, although the last application. Hopefully, I'll get to talk to you about that another time. Brothers and sisters, what I want you to take away from this message is that we have a responsibility to ensure that this church is built with sound teaching. I went over to my parents' house a few weeks back. My dad was rather proud of his garden, and he should have been. He took me out in the backyard, also his honeybees. He's got, he's got three hives going right now. Um, if you know him, ask him about it. You will learn a lot about bees. Okay. Anyway, we're in the backyard, and I could see the neighbor's garden, which was roughly the same size, and I could see my dad's garden. And he had reason to boast. Hey, it was looking good, looking really good. And so he's telling me about what he did this year that was different than what he normally does. He said, well, this year I didn't, I didn't water it as much. I'm like, okay, what did that do? And, he's, and some of you, in the first service, people were nodding. Some people were nodding their heads like, I don't know anything about. I always feel like, is it time to water or not? I don't know. But he watered less. And he said, what, what that does is when, when the plant is in that, 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 that crisis or that struggle, it, its roots, it, it drives the roots down deeper. It, it struggles to, to, to get to a place of where it can get water. And so he had done that. And I'm telling you, it, it was. It was quite a bit different from, from the neighbor. And, and he says quite a bit different from what he had before. Let me... Let me let me read this to you. So this, this, the, the point I'm trying to make is the struggle actually made the plant stronger and when the water came, explosive growth, right? First Peter 2, 1 and 2. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk. Paul's referring to the word, to the, to the Bible. Long for the pure spiritual milk of the word that by it you may grow up into salvation. We have struggled, some of us individually. This has been a, a season many of us over the past few years have struggled, struggled. As a congregation, it's been a rough year. We've struggled. That struggle is already causing us to put our roots down, to sink them deep down into the nourishing soil of God's word. God has promised that growth will come. It will come. Our roots in the soil of his word, the rain will come and it will grow. And that's the growth we want, the kind that God gives. Let me thank you, Connection Group teachers and leaders, for what you do week in and week out. It is so essential. It's not about the buildings and the, the budgets and the size. It's not about none of that. What you build with your instruction every single week is the church of Jesus Christ. That's what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, congregation. All of you who have kept the faith, who have worked tirelessly, you work tirelessly week in and week out to do what is good for Christ's sake in this church. Thank you. Thank you for having the maturity to recognize struggle is not foreign to Christian experience, or to churches. Every church has issues. We all struggle. This is our opportunity to be strong in the Word of God. Thank you for having the maturity to participate in a process of resetting. Thank you. Thank you for cherishing the Scripture and going to it first and foremost and letting it test your assumptions, your way of doing things, your preferences, has to test that for us. Thank you for doing that so that we can do our part in making disciples of all nations to the glory of God. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father, for this morning and the opportunity to open this passage of Scripture with these brothers and sisters of mine. We ask you to have your way in us and do your work. By your word, build us up.
just as we've seen in the scriptures by it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.